Hello and welcome to another edition of Monday Night Calculus. I'm Curtis Brown, your host, and I'm joined by Steve Kokoska and Tom Dick. I'm super excited to have you guys here this evening. Um, we'll get started here in just a second. Before we do, though, I just want to remind you that you do have an opportunity to go and download the questions that Steve's going to be looking at here and the, the examples that he's going to use um, from our website, the TI website. There's a bulletin board post. Uh, we'll make sure we get that in the chat really quickly here so you can go there and download the problem set. We'll have the solutions up there uh, sometime later this week. Um, and that's also got all of the problem sets and solutions for all of our previous uh, Monday night calculus um, values, and that's where we're going to continue to um, do this in the spring. We'll continue to to update that blog with uh, with the same or with the new uh, schedule and the new problem sets. And so, um, really excited to hear that some of you guys are using those with your students. Um, keep it up. We'd love to hear feedback and things that you guys have thoughts about that. So, uh, Steve, I'll let you get it started for us. All righty, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen here, see if things are working. I'll bring up the slides. Yep. And there we go. How's that looking? Okay. Looks great. Fantastic. Well, tonight's topic, Curtis, is the fundamental theorem of calculus. And thanks for setting this up. And Tom, great to see you again. This is one of my favorite topics, favorite subjects to talk about. It's uh, fitting that we talk about this, I guess, at the end of the calendar year here, the end of sort of an academic term for many colleges and universities. It is the most important idea in all of AP calculus, I think all of calculus perhaps. And I'm probably gonna get a little too excited here as I talk about this. So I'm even gonna give you an outline tonight, Curtis. I'm gonna talk a little bit or give a little bit of background to this idea first. And then I'm going to try to interpret uh, this theorem. And I think we're kind of lucky in this case. We can actually visualize part of this theorem. So I'm going to draw a couple of graphs. And the FTC, as you know, uh, Curtis, we usually split into two parts. And part right. one, I'm going to, of course, uh, give a statement of that. We'll lead into that in a couple of examples. And then I'll do the same thing with part two. And then I'm gonna end my presentation talking about net change. This is just sort of another way to look at the fundamental theorem of calculus. And I think a way that we see in the AP calculus exam quite often. So we'll look at that towards the end. So here's a brief introduction and I won't read through everything here, but I do wanna emphasize again that this is one of the most important ideas in all of calculus. Um, if you were to look at the AP Calculus Course and Exam Description Booklet, under, I think it's Big Idea 1, I think there are three big ideas now change. There's a, a sentence in there about the fundamental theorem of calculus being a central idea in AP Calculus. And it's also mentioned, again, I think, in Unit 6. So, look, this is a very important concept. Students have to know this call. There are certainly going to be problems, questions about this on the AP exam this spring. So big picture, what does this do? Well, the FTC establishes this connection between the two branches of calculus in my mind, uh, differential calculus and integral calculus. And it really gives us a precise relationship, inverse relationship between the derivative and the integral. And again, the way that I look at this, these, the FTC allows us to do two important things here, or it allows two important processes. Maybe that's a better way to say it. First, it allows us to commute, compute many, different, many definite integrals easily. Um, we may have mentioned this, I think, in the last broadcast, Curtis. You know, if we had to actually find a definite integral by definition, we'd have to go back to Riemann sums, and that's extremely painful. And so right. the FTC allows us to bypass that and actually evaluate definite integrals theoretically easier. And it also allows us to find an antiderivative of any continuous function. Tom reminds me of this frequently. So this really says that any continuous function has an antiderivative, sometimes lost in all the, in all the hoopla here. So here's a little bit of background. The FTC part one deals with functions that are defined by an equation in this form. So g of x is equal to the definite integral 
from A to X of F of T V T, and we're assuming here that F is a continuous function on this interval, this closed interval A to B, and X can be any value between A and B. Now, when I teach this, I think my students have a difficult time looking at this and saying, well, is that really a function? It doesn't look like anything that, you know, they have perhaps seen. It doesn't look like a traditional sort of algebraic function, but indeed it is a function. This function G depends only on X, which is the upper limit of that integral. Notice that the lower limit A here is a constant and it's fixed. And one way that I often explain this, I think simply is that look, if X is fixed, if we put in a specific number up there, okay, we get a specific number back. We get a definite number back. But as X varies, certainly this definite integral also varies. And so that's one way to sort of justify that indeed, you know, that really is a function. Now, at least in my mind, I can sort of visualize this function in a special case. If that happens to be a positive continuous function, then g of x can be interpreted as the area under the graph of f above the x-axis from a to x. So here's sort of a picture of that, that blue shaded region. That area equals g of x, where well, x is any number, any value between a and b. And I know I get kidded about this a lot, but I think of g as what I call, oops, I'm sorry about that, as an area so far function. I start out at a, and as I move left to right, g is accumulating area, so it's sort of the area so far. And here's my visualization of all of this in that graph. So that's kind of cool. This is a different kind of function, one that many students have probably not seen up till this point in the class. And I think we're kind of lucky that we can visualize, I can see what this function looks like in this special case. Now, there are lots of AP calculus exam questions involving this concept of the fundamental theorem of calculus and indeed that function G. Now, it would be really nice to have a formula for that area so far function, you know, a closed form expression. And look, there are lots of discovery exercises available on the web and, and just lots of books that deal with discovering that G prime is really equal to F. And that's part of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. But I don't know if you've seen this one before, Curtis, but I'm gonna do a little bit of graphical and analytical justification for why, like that, why that might be true. So here's my function, my function F, a graph of F, which is positive and continuous on A to B. So again, G of X is the integral from A to X of F of T dt. And I'm considering this blue shaded region right in here between X and X plus H, where H is a small value. So that blue shaded region is really G of X plus H minus G of X. And I think if I take H kind of small here, I can approximate that area by the area of a rectangle, a skinny rectangle with width H and height F of X. So if you buy that, now I'm gonna divide both sides of this equation by H. Now this expression sort of looks familiar. And if I take the limit of that expression down here, that's just the derivative G prime. And okay, I'll argue loosely that there is no H on that side. So that's just constant. So the limit as H goes to zero of that constant is just the constant F of X. And that's some graphical combined with analytical justification that you know what the derivative of that function G is F. And that's kind of cool. Yeah, Steve, that's a really important thing. Um, statement too, especially we're getting, um, Gerald, Gerald has uh, called us out that this is such an important piece for students to have um, and something for them to be able to make on the AP exam. Indeed. It's such a really important thing to do. Indeed. Give me one more second here, Curtis, and I'll get to some problems. I hope that are AP calculus exam type. So here's a more formal statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one. 
So what we've just kind of gone through and shown a little bit is that if g of x is defined to be this function right here, it is continuous on the closed interval a to b, it's differentiable on the open interval, and in fact, the most important result here is that g prime of x is equal to f of x. So you can think about this function, uh, pardon me, this theorem in words, the derivative of the definite integral with respect to its upper limit is the integrand evaluated at that upper limit. And I wanted to add this in down here at the bottom because this is kind of common notation that we see. And it sort of emphasizes this idea, at least in my mind, Curtis, that integration and differentiation are inverse functions. So what the integral does, differentiation undoes, and we end up where we started, the sort of inverse operations. So let's see how this FTC part one might be, might be used. We might get a question like this. Let's see if we can find the derivative of each of these functions. So here's g of x in this first case. Let's see the definite integral from zero to x of that nasty square root. And if I want the derivative of that, well, let's see. This, this is my function f of t. I've got a lower bound of zero, a constant, an upper bound of just a fixed, pardon me, just the, the variable x. So the FTC part one says, well, I just need to evaluate that integrand at that variable x and I'm done. There's nothing else that I need to do. Curtis, I'm gonna ask you a question. I don't wanna put you on the spot here, but what do you think is a common <laughs> error here for students when they look at a question like this? What do you think is a common mistake here? Any ideas? Tom probably knows this one. I might pass to Tom on that one. Yeah, what do you think? I could make lots of mistakes, but I don't know that any of them would be common. <laughs> well, a common error here is for some students to look at this and say, well, I've got to try to find uh, the definite integral first. So that means I've got to try to find an antiderivative of that function. And oh, sure, think, yeah. I don't think you can. And that tends to lead to a lot of errors here. And so... The reason that I think students make that mistake is that they don't recognize this sort of expression as an application of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Right. They're taking the derivative of this definite integral. And so they're looking at just the one piece and saying, oh, well, I've got to find an antiderivative. That's a common error. And here's another one, which would be even worse if I tried to find a, an antiderivative. I don't think I can. And again, it's very easy. The derivative of that function h is just the integrand evaluated at that upper variable limit x. Cool. So Steve, if I can interject. Yeah, please. Yeah, I think another common error is um, for students sometimes not to realize it's as long as that upper limit is just the variable x it is just substituting into that integrand function. And sometimes they wanna take it a step further and do something with a further derivative, like a chain rule kind of thing. Correct, like, yeah. Really a simple substitution right in there. And you're done, yep. And I got another couple of comments here. Somebody write, you know, students might write this in terms of T instead of X. So I might, you know, they, they write their, their answer there in terms of T instead of X. That's so over something. here is something like the cosine of E to the T. Right, of E to the T over T squared plus four. Yeah. Um, so, so would so that, that could, be right? Would that be, would you get full credit for that? Well, first of all, I think these kinds of questions generally appear on the multiple choice portion of the exam. Tom, agree on that one? Yes, I would agree. Yeah, they're usually on the multiple choice portion of the exam. So, sure. you know, that might be a possible choice that is a distractor. Right. Uh, and certainly that's incorrect. On the free response portion of the exam, you know, that's a tough call, Curtis. I don't know how many points something like that would be worth one or two at the most. I guess if I were still the chief reader, I really want to see an X in there. Right, for sure. I, I would think so. I really want to see the X. Yeah. There's some discussion about this, this idea of thinking about this um, from the big picture before diving in and, you know, really getting students to, to, to think about this from, uh, to slow down. That's probably the big thing, right? <laughs> slow down just yeah. for a second here and, and let's think this through before we just dive in. I know I have that problem sometimes. <laughs>
All right, well, let's take this a little bit further here. This is another common sort of a question, and I'm gonna beat this one into the ground, Curtis. I'm sorry, I'm gonna do a little bit more than is necessary, maybe, but I want you to see where everything's coming from. So let's find the derivative of this definite integral. And this one, notice that the upper limit here is a function of x. So we have to attack this one just a little bit differently. And here's the way that I see it long-windedly. In order to take the derivative of this, I have to use the chain rule. So I'm going to let that upper limit be u, where u is equal to x cubed. So how do you take the derivative of this thing using the chain rule? You start at the outermost function, and you work your way in. So you take the derivative of this expression with respect to u times the derivative of u with respect to x. I think that's, that's the chain rule applied to this fundamental theorem of calculus part one. How about that? That's a mouthful. So now I come down here, there's the FTC. I have the sine of u times du dx. I'm not done. I have to finish this problem by getting everything back into the x world. So u is equal to x cubed. That was my initial substitution. And I take the derivative of x cubed by using the power rule. That's a 3x squared. That's a classic sort of example. Um, I used, uh, again, I've probably done a little bit more than is necessary. I know that many of your students are good enough and they can just look at this and write down the answer and know, well, uh, that's the sine of x cubed and I multiply by the derivative of that expression up top here. That's fine if you've done many of those. But let me extend this just a little bit further. And I'm not gonna solve this one, Curtis, but we'll leave this as an open question because there's a question like this um, on the homework problems that we gave today. So in this one, we want the derivative of this integral where the lower bound is a function of x and the upper bound is also a function of x. So this one might not look like the fundamental theorem of calculus, but at least in my mind, in order to solve this one, we've got to get this back to some sort of expression that we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So I'll leave it at that. That's sort of a challenge question. We'll leave that one open. I don't think I can find a closed form antiderivative of that. So you're gonna have to use the FTC in some way, okay? All right, well, let's take a look at the FTC part two here. This says if f is continuous on the closed interval a to b, then the definite integral from a to b of little f of x dx is capital F of b minus capital F of a, where f is any antiderivative of little f. And that means that capital F prime is equal to little f prime. So this is really a cool, this is a very powerful theorem. It says, look, instead of using Riemann sums, instead of going back to limits, we can now evaluate a definite integral if we can find an antiderivative, capital F. That's all we have to do. And we evaluate it at those two values, A and B, and we subtract. Now, I'm not gonna do one of these problems this evening, Curtis, but uh, maybe put this on your list. This might be a good topic for the spring. Maybe we could do a, a presentation on particle motion. Uh, but there is an application here that I just wanted to quickly talk about. If the velocity function is v of t and the position function is s of t, we know that v of t is equal to s prime. So if we just think about, think about this picture, think about the geometry in the background, for a particle moving in only the positive direction, I gotta think about this just a little bit. If it's moving only in the positive direction, then that means the velocity is positive. The area under the velocity curve is equal to the distance traveled. So we've sort of discovered that by just thinking about this result, the FTC part two, and we can maybe do more with uh, particle motion in the spring, that might be fun. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. All right, so here's the FTC part two in action. And there are a lot of little things going on, I think, in this problem. A lot of little AT calculus uh, pointers, I think. Tom, don't let me miss anything here. I want to evaluate this definite integral from 0 to 3 of x, e to the minus x squared. OK, so as you look at that, how are you going to solve that one? And I think you know this takes a lot of practice. And many times my student asks ask me, 
how do I get good at this stuff? And unfortunately, maybe my answer is, well, you just got to do a lot of these. And you got to look at that and you've got to see that, well, look, if u is equal to this expression minus x squared, I see the derivative of u, except for a constant, loosely hanging around inside in that integral. So I'm going to try a change of variables. I'm going to let u be equal to minus x squared. And this is the way that I do this, Curtis, a little bit more long-winded maybe, but easier for me. I'm going to take the derivative of both sides here, du on the left, minus 2x dx. Don't forget that on the right-hand side. And I always go one more step here. My next step is I always solve for dx. And the reason that I do that is because I know I'm changing from the x world into the u world. And so I know that I need an expression for dx. Now, in this particular problem, since it is a definite integral, I have to drag along the bounds also. So when x is 0, u is 0. When x is 3, u is equal to minus 9. So here's my first step. Let's see, when x is zero, u is zero. When x is three, u is minus nine. So one of the first things to notice here is that the bounds have sort of switched here. In other words, I have the lower value as the upper bound. Um, sometimes that frightens students, but look, that's okay. When we make a change of variables, that kind of thing can happen. I can't do anything yet with that x hanging around out front, but I've got an e to the u here and Here's my expression for dx. Now I understand that some of my colleagues balk at this step because it's an integrand that has two variables in it, u and x. But I think of this as my bridge. I think of this as my bridge that's connecting the x world and the u world. And I'm walking across that bridge and I've got a couple of variables here and now I'm gonna try to simplify. And if everything works out here, my x is canceled. My one half will go all the way through the definite integral sign. Constants pass freely through integral signs and there's the minus sign. There's the minus one half out in front. Now, before I go and integrate that, I'll find an antiderivative I'll mention too. You know, when some students do this, they like to keep these bounds in terms of X with the intention, I think, of going back into the X world. Now, look, that's okay. <clears throat> but you've got to make that very clear. In other words, up here, you've got to write something like x equals three and down here, x equals zero. I don't advise that. I think that it's much easier when you make a change of variables, drag along the bounds, find your antiderivative and do the evaluation in the U world. That's the way that a change of variables works and I think in general, it's much easier to do that way. So here's an antiderivative of e to the u. One of the easy ones is just e to the u. I evaluated everything and I think I got a final symbolic answer down below, minus one half, e to the minus nine minus one, pretty cool. That's, I think, a very nice AP calculus question. Uh, it employs the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. There's a change of variables there. Curtis, any questions on that one? Coming in. No, I don't think we've had any questions uh, on this at all. I think everybody's okay. sticking right with us. Okay. Um, I'm not going to uh, solve these two questions, but I'm going to leave these for consideration. So here's another definite integral. Uh, this one is e to the x squared, e to the x dx. Uh, we'll leave that to see if uh, our participants can find that one. And here's an interesting one that often leads to some errors. We'll just leave that as an open question too. Uh, the definite integral from minus two to two of one over x squared dx. Good questions. All right, so here's another alternate interpretation to this fundamental theorem of calculus. And again, this sort of idea, this presentation, this interpretation, I think appears frequently on the exam. Look, if capital F prime represents the rate of change of capital F with respect to X. And capital F of B minus capital F of A is the change in Y as X changes from A to B. But look, let's consider the case where F could be positive or negative for part of the way from A to B. Then capital F of B minus capital F of A is really the net change in Y. So some people, 
Some of us call this the net change theory. And it says the definite integral of a rate of change is the net change in the original function, capital F. So this is really just another way to write the conclusion of the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, but to think about this in terms of change. And son of a gun, I'm going to beat this into the ground. I'm going to write this in another way, too. I'm going to think of the definite integral from A to B of capital F prime of X dx as an accumulation of the change in F over that integral, interval, excuse me, A to B. I'm going to rearrange the terms in that net change theorem from the previous slide. And I'm going to write this as capital F of B, and I'm going to think of that as my end amount, is equal to my start amount, capital F of A, plus the net change, this definite integral. This idea, I think, appears frequently on the AP calculus exam, uh, most notably, I think, with particle motion, often also on the calculator active portion of the exam, for our BC students, often they'll see a particle moving in the plane and this net change theorem written like this will apply say to uh, one of the components. So a very common, I think, interpretation. So I'm gonna yeah. do one. I was just gonna say, we got a comment in that about students struggling to make that uh, integral interpretation, net change versus total. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that's a big struggle for Indeed. students, for sure. Well, let's do a cell phone uh, battery uh, question, Curtis. Are you getting a new iPhone for Christmas or are you on the naughty list? <laughs> I'm probably getting coal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's- If I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> a cell phone battery has 500, I think that's the right way to say this, milliampere hours of power and it's plugged into a charger. So it's maybe getting close to the end of the evening. I'm getting ready to go to sleep. I'm gonna plug it into my charger. And the rate at which this cell phone battery increases in power, be careful because this is a rate, is given by this function where T is measured in hours. Find the amount of power in the battery after 30 minutes. Be careful here, one little thing here. I think T is given in hours and I'm asking for 30 minutes. So I think students have to be able to read this kind of a problem in context. They have to recognize that, you know what, I'm really looking for net change here. And I have an initial condition or I have a start point. I know that there are 500 MAH in this battery to start out with. So I'm gonna introduce a new function here. I'm gonna call it capital T. It is the total power in the cell phone battery at time T. And this is just an application of that formula that I had on the previous page. Here is the initial amount of power in the cell phone battery. Here's the net change from zero to 0.5 hours, so 30 minutes. And I apologize, Curtis, I didn't put a, a uh, I did not put a uh, graphing calculator screenshot here, but that's how I got this answer. If you take a quick peek up here, we're not going to be able to find a closed form antiderivative of that. So this is a calculator active problem. So after 30 minutes, there are approximately 1,480 mAh of power in this cell phone battery. Nice problem. Now, I'm not going to solve these, but I'm going to add a little, a little bit to this. I think this is a nice extension to this problem. Uh, maybe this is something you could work on, teachers out there. You could work on this with your students tomorrow morning. So while the cell phone is connected to the charger, uh, you probably decided, well, I'm going to watch one of those Netflix movies on my cell phone. And so even though it's connected and, and is, is charging, it's also discharging some power at this rate. So there's two things going on here. There is some power coming in, but there's some power going out. And I think there's three nice questions here about the amount of power in the cell phone battery increasing or decreasing at time t equal one, how much power is in the cell phone battery at 1.5 hours, and find the maximum amount of power in the cell phone battery over that time. So that's a nice extension to that and a question, uh, of course, in context. All right, well, that takes care of that presentation. Curtis, I'm gonna try the solutions here. 
We'll post these. Uh, we'll post these. I'll get these to you tomorrow or Wednesday for sure. I'm going to go through a couple of these. I won't go through these in gory detail because we are posting these. But here's the first one. Suppose the function g is defined by this integral. So this is uh, very typical. What and we were talking just about. To be, just to be clear, before yeah. you jump in there, I want to just to be clear, these are the problems that we post um, every week, right? We post these ahead of time. Um, I guess every other week we post these ahead of time for um, you to use with your students, either in instruction or um, give them. I've, we've seen them be used as as quizzes or things of that nature. Um, but these are actually intended for you to use with your students. Um, and then we'll post the solutions to these at a, at a little bit later date. So um, Steve's going to go through and look at these solutions um, here and, and then we'll post them here shortly shortly after that so very good so this is a nice ap calculus exam question that uh, relies on the fundamental theorem of calculus and of course an equation of a tangent line here's this function this area so far function i don't think we can find a closed form antiderivative of that find an equation of the line tangent to the graph of g at x equal to well i need a point and a slope so i'm going to find g of two and that's pretty easy here i don't have to do anything that's not really the fundamental theorem of calculus at all right right there uh, since the upper bound and the lower bound are, same, are the same this definite integral is zero so darn it i think i've got a point that it goes through to zero i can find the slope by finding g prime that's the fundamental theorem of calculus part one and g prime of two is i think one sixteenth so there's a quick equation of the tangent line. B was really a cool question too. It went from the very easy, I think, to the not more complex, but boy, you really had to be careful in some of these calculations. So here's a new function H. And boy, this is very typical of recent AP exam questions. You know, we have a function G, but let's define a new one in terms of this old one. So H of X is G of the square root of X, find H of four. Well, that's not bad here. H of four is G of the square root of four. And I already know that G of two is zero. So that one's pretty easy. Let's see, did I do this right? H prime is G prime. I got to use the chain rule here. So it's G prime of the square root of X times the derivative of the inner function. Well, let's see, do I have G prime up there? Yeah, there it is. Is it still on my screen? There it is. There's G prime. I plug in the square root of X, I think I get an X. So there we go. There's an analytic expression for H prime of X. And I think when I plugged in a four, I got a one over 64. How about that? And here's where it gets a little complex. I got to take the derivative now of H prime to find H double prime. And that's a quotient rule. And so here's my first step. I think I've got all the pieces in there. There's a lot of simplification going on in there with the three dots. And here's what I got as a symbolic answer. And that's kind of cool. Uh, I, again, Curtis, sorry about this. I don't have a screenshot up here, but I believe you can actually find that uh, exact analytic answer, I think with a TI inspired cast version, which is really cool. That's All right, awesome. in number two. Hey, so, Steve, before you jump into number two, yes. um, I did get a couple of interesting questions here and you can choose how and when you want to try to answer them. Okay. Uh, so the question about how and when and who uh, discovered the FTC or maybe, maybe better put kind of recorded it and uh, you know, read it, wrote it down. You know, Tom's an expert on the history of calculus. So he'll know this one. I would go with probably Newton or Leibniz, Tom. Huh? That was going to be my guess. Well, that's the, uh, that was the big dispute. So I, I think uh, historians feel that Newton probably um, thought of it first, but he didn't bother to publish it. That's right. Leibniz, <laughs> and Leibniz, I think, came up with the idea completely on his own, but a little bit after that, he published it first. So there was this kind of big argument, and the uh, uh, the Germans and the English were really trash talking each other. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to, the primacy of that incredible discovery for their country. So. Yeah. 
Tom, uh, while we're on the subject, wasn't there a colleague of ours at the UNH who was who wrote this history of mathematics book? Oh yeah, David Burton. David yeah. Burton, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. We should get him on the line. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. all right. Back to number two. Here's a uh, problem similar to one that I left as sort of a challenge. Here's k of x, which is an integral from the sine of x to the cosine of x t dt. This has a couple of nice twists in it. Let me take a quick look at this one if I can first. k of zero here. Well, what I'm going to do is plug in x equals zero, and that just becomes the definite integral from zero to one of t dt. Very straightforward, one half. k of one fourth, well, I'm going to pl plug in a, an x equal, oops, I'm sorry, did I do that wrong? That's going to be a pi, I apologize. That's a pi, it's kind of hard to see but that's actually a pi. So that's cosine of pi over four uh, up top, sine of pi over four down below. That gives me the exact same upper and lower bound. So that's zero. So I, I don't think there's really any fundamental theorem of calculus stuff going on there, but uh, good use of mathematical notation, which we're stressing. So, all right, use the FTC part one to find K prime. So this is the way that I would do it. And probably again, a little long winded, but I would break this up into two separate integrals. So I'm using a property of definite integrals here, and this does not have to be zero, but can be any value of this constant C. And then what I'm going to do is use another property of integrals. I'm, I, I don't know why, I just like to have that constant down there. It's a lower bound. It just makes it easier for me to understand. So if I flip the bounds here, I've got to put a negative sign out in front. And now I can take the derivative of each one of those. And I've skipped just a little bit here, uh, Curtis. I hope that's okay. Here's the FTC part one. I plug in the sine of X into T and I need to take the derivative of that expression up top. There's the cosine plus the cosine of X plugging into the integrand times the derivative of what's up top minus the sine of X. And there's a little bit of simplification there. And that's kind of cool. And we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to show that k of x is equal to this. And what I did in this case was, I'm going to sneak back up here if I can. You know, we can actually find a closed form antiderivative here. And so that's what I did down below. I plugged in the cosine of x and the sine of x is the upper and the lower bound. And I did a little, I think I used a little trig identity to get that. Nice problem, Tom. Really nice problem. So could I... Uh challenge you, Steve, to try something. Sure. Okay. <laughs> he answered that the way I usually do. <laughs> you, buddy. <laughs> uh, Will, your part C there, you, uh, you showed nicely that K of X is uh, one half the cosine of two X. Uh, what if we just use that formula for K of X and found K prime of X, the derivative? Okay. So let's see, let's start out with K of X. Is this what you're asking? Let's do this. Right, and take the derivative. And let's take K prime. Okay, there's my one half. I'll start at the outside and work my way in. The derivative of the cosine minus the sine of two X. I'll multiply times the derivative of the inner function two. I'll do a little simplifying. It looks like I have minus the sine of two X, which I guess if I wanted to, I could use a trig identity. Ah, okay, you got ahead of me. That's right. I was going to say up just above here on your screen, you've got k prime of x is negative two times sine of x cosine x. So if I use a trig identity minus, how about that? We get the exact same thing. Ah, all right. Very so reassuring. Yeah. How about that? All right. A little bit of number three, and I'll turn it over to Tom Curtis. Thanks for your patience with me here. This is a, a very typical sort of a question. We felt obligated to put one of these in the homework problems. Yeah. Here's a function g defined by uh, definite integral five to x of f of t dt. F is this function given graphically in this figure. It's made up of a couple of straight line segments and I think a half circle in there. And we want to find g of 12 and g of minus five. Um, I won't go through all of this. Uh, there's some pretty detailed solutions here. We're going to find both of these by using the geometry in the figure. We've got to be a little bit careful 
about whether or not the area is above the x-axis or below the x-axis. But there's g of five and there's g of minus five. As you take a look at this after this is posted, be careful, there's a lot of minus signs, at least the way that I did this one. But I think the answer is 25 pi over two. And I'll just mention something briefly here about part B. This is also a, a, a typical sort of a question, a part of a question here. Find the maximum value of G on this closed interval. Well, look, the way that I attack this is I've got to find all the places where G prime of X is equal to zero or where G prime of X does not exist. I've got to find the critical points or the critical values. You know, there is a tendency, sorry, Curtis, I'm going to sneak back up here just for a second. There is a tendency to try to identify these values right here as critical points or critical values of the function G, but they're not. Remember that that is a graph of G prime and it exists everywhere. So there are no places, it sounds kind of funny, where G prime of X does not exist. Now, the one thing I wanted to point out here in this problem was uh, often in these questions on the AP calculus exam, you can eliminate one or two or a couple of values here. And you can indeed eliminate minus five and five right away. I'm gonna leave this as sort of open, uh, but remind you that if you do this on the exam, if you have determined that, well, wait a minute, minus five and five are critical points, you can't just leave them aside and sort of imply to eliminate them. You must give some sort of an explanation as to why they're eliminated. I'll leave a little bit of that to you. I think you can make an argument, very simple argument by looking at this graph of F, knowing that that is the graph of the derivative of G. And I found the value of G at those remaining three values. And I think my maximum was eight plus 25 pi over two, kind of cool. And I added a little bit more in here. This is actually a graph of G, which I produced using a, a technology. And when you get to take a look at this solution, you might try to convince yourself or have your students convince you that indeed this graph up here is the derivative of the one down here. Does this, does, do these graphs really make sense? All right, we do have solutions to the remaining three parts. We'll post those. Uh, Curtis, I'm sorry, I think I've probably gone over time. I'll turn it over to Tom. Um, you ready over there, Tom? I think so. so All right, there you go. Air screen here. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to uh, start out by looking at the PI-84. And let's see, you guys can give me some feedback. Sometimes I fumble a little bit, but are you seeing my TI-84 screen here? I am indeed. Looks good. Excellent, okay. So I've um, just gone into a Y equals menu. And uh, one of the functions that we were looking at in these homework problems was the first one that um, uh, Steve was looking at. I, and I believe it was uh, the integrand was the function two uh, raised to the negative of, I'm going to use x of my variable, x squared. So two to the negative x squared. Uh, and this showed up in an integrand that, that Steve was looking at. Um, so what I want to think about is an antiderivative for this function. So let's just go ahead and graph it. And we get this nice, uh, it's kind of a bell-shaped curve and we can think about it. Let's see, uh, well, it's pretty easy to evaluate at zero. Two to the negative zero squared, that'd just be two to the zero is one, makes sense. And then as uh, X gets bigger in either the positive direction or negative direction, that X squared, the negative exponent, that's gonna be, uh, get smaller and smaller. So we get this, Curve, it's nice and symmetrical. And the question is, uh, what would an antiderivative of this function look like? Now, a question like this, I really like to present a graph like this and just think about it graphically. So if we're looking at this, if this is the derivative function, 
Oh, I see it's really, really close to zero over here. So that's going to mean that we're going to have a very flat function. It's a slope has to be zero or very close to zero. And then remember, these are going to be slope values. Okay, at zero, we're going to have a slope of one. And then our slopes are going to go back down. It looks like all of our slopes will be positive but our biggest slope will be right at zero. We'll have our steepest slope will be one and the slope will get close to zero as we go in the, either the positive negative X direction. Uh, now, what's so cool about the fundamental theorem of calculus is it gives us a, just a recipe where we can immediately write down an antiderivative for any continuous function. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to the Y equals menu and take advantage of that formula, uh, we're going to use an integral of this 2 to the minus x squared. So I'll bring up the math menu. And down there at the very bottom, you see number 9 is the function integral. It actually comes up in a nice, I guess they call it pretty print form. Where we can plug math in. print, I think, is math the technical print. term. Now, I think in the uh, homework, we had a lower limit of two, if I'm not mistaken. So, whoops, let's see, let me correct that. Is that right, Steve? I think that lower limit was yeah, two. Yeah, I can hang on, hang on one second. Okay. And I'll make yes, the upper that's limit. Right. That's right, yeah. it was two. Okay, upper limit of X, that's our variable. And I'm gonna practice, I guess, some good uh, variable usage here. I'll make my integrand, well, it's gonna be Y1 but I'm going to make the variable t. So we'll do y1 of t and we'll integrate with respect to t. Now, if you actually used x again as your variable of integration, uh, it really wouldn't complain. It's really just a dummy variable, but it's not the best form to use x on a double duty there. So that's why I used t there. Uh, and so this should just plot a Tom, function. is there an extra parentheses in there? Um, there might be. For the Y1? Yeah. Yes. Mm. You either yeah. need to close that parentheses or just... Uh, delete it? Delete it, yeah. You know, I'm not sure it's going to... Yeah, I think you have to close it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you don't have to, but... All right. Well, I see it'll 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 automatically do that. Is that right, mm -hmm. Curtis? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't want to put it here. Right. So. Right. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, let's try let's try graphing it and see what happens here. Now you might be thinking, "Wow, this is graphing kind of slowly," but if you think about what the uh, calculator is doing, is for each x value, it's putting it into that upper limit and it's calculating a separate definite integral value for each value uh, that we're plotting here. Now let's, let's recollect what we were thinking about. We should have a graph that's very, very flat. So this graph, this blue graph is zero, close to zero. Our graph should have a slope of one at zero that looks nice. And then our slopes, all our slopes should be positive, but they should be getting really, really close to zero as X gets bigger. So this graph really looks nice. It's really fitting. Um, so that's, um, I just want to show, I think this is a fantastic thing to do with your uh, Graphing calculator, PI-84 has no problem at all graphing that as a function. Like Steve says, uh, when students see those definite interval functions, it looks so weird and so unfamiliar. Is that really a function? Uh, and I found students are more likely to believe it when you say, look, you can just graph it like any function. Well, I just like the fact that you've got the uh, the ability to make connections now, right? You're, you're talking about the slope being approximately equal to one or actually equal to one right there as you go across um, the, the axis and, and 
being able to make the visual comparison between the two um, helps significantly, I think. And just the ability to type it in and see it happen sl uh, slowly actually is, I think, a good thing here where you can really kind of tie the two things together um, and, and make the connection between the two, the computation of what's happening as we go along, kind of checking the points. So I think it's a great thing to show students that way. It's a feature I, I really make use of a lot, this plotting definite integral functions. Mm -hmm. uh, you might get impatient with how slowly it graphs. So I just wanted to show a, a, a bit of a thing that you can do to speed it up. Uh, I'm going to uh, go to my window. And this is where you usually set your X min, X max, Y min, Y max. But the, the value that I'm interested in changing is down here near the bottom. It's this thing that says X res. And I'm gonna change that from one to two. And what that's gonna do is it's only going to calculate every other pixel as I go across, which means it's gonna plot twice as fast as it did before. Let's give mm -hmm. it a try and see what happens. Here's that red graph. And you remember how it crawled across the screen, screen <laughs> before. And there we go, it's great. Um, here's a kind of interesting question. Uh, what if I had changed the lower limit of integration to some number other than two? Let's go back to y equals. See that lower limit of two? Here, what if we, uh, see, what I'm gonna do is I, I'm gonna leave that like it is and just go ahead and try this again. With my integral, I'm gonna put a lower limit of zero this time, upper limit of X. And then again, let's just do our Y1 of E. Uh, there are, there's my closed parentheses. That's yeah. What I'm to do. It, it forgave me. And look, it put it in before <laughs> for me. So, okay. So let's think about this before we plot. Um, I'm going to get a different function, but from the fundamental theorem of calculus, both of these functions should have this y1 as if they're derivative. They should have exactly the same derivative. I seem to remember there's something, if two functions have the same derivative, they can only differ by a constant. Mm -hmm. Well, let's graph these and see what that new function looks like. Holy mackerel, it's just a vertical shift of the red function there. So. And a reality check, because the lower limit was zero, let's see, that's one that's really easy to evaluate. The definite integral from zero to zero would just be zero. So it crosses right at the origin. The red graph, it's hard to tell, but it's crossing at x equal two because of the lower limit. So it's a really simple use of the, the 84, but I think incredibly powerful. And um, I, I'll, I'll share with you, when I was a student myself taking calculus, um, I remember not being impressed by the fundamental theorem part one. Uh, part one is to say, is, says, hey, you take any continuous function, here's a way to manufacture an antiderivative instantly for it. But my problem was, I thought, well, that doesn't do me any good because I don't know what the antiderivative of the integrand is. This is circular. But we don't need to know uh, a closed form antiderivative. In fact, if you try to calculate the antiderivative of this function, even with a computer algebra system, it would just spit it back at you. In fact, if you want to see that, uh, let's see, I'm going to stop my share of the 84. 
and switch over to the Inspire. You guys will need to give me some feedback to see if this is working. Okay. Seeing yep, that. we're good. Inspire. Um, we're good. Okay, I'm going to just insert a calculator page and let's go ahead and do a calculus integral. And I'm just going to do a straight antiderivative. So I won't put in limits of integration. Um, let's put in, say, x squared dx. The computer algebra system gives me x cubed over 3. So it gives me an antiderivative for x squared. Very nice. Let me try the function we were looking at. So I'll do calculus again. Oops, I think I hit the wrong one. Let's uh, undo. Just to be clear, Tom, you're using the CAS machine, right? The computer That's algebra right. system. I one that has a computer algebra system. Uh, but if I wanted to do an antiderivative of that function we were looking at before, uh, let's see, that was uh, 2 raised to the negative x squared. And with respect to x, not even a computer algebra system can touch this with a 10-foot pencil. So, yeah. so um, but... So we don't have a nice formula for the antiderivative to the negative x squared, but we can graph it as easy as pi with, uh, with any graphing calculator. So 84 has no computer algebra on it at all, but we got a perfectly good graph of an antiderivative for this function. I think that's a really powerful statement to, to show um, and show your students as well. And I know there was some discussion earlier about um, taking that antiderivative um, by elementary methods wasn't possible. Um, and so that's, uh, this is a really nice picture of, of that same thing um, and how you can get where you need to get to um, using FTC. Yeah. Well, I think I'm, pretty close to out of time. So I'm going right. to pass it back on back to you. Uh, for well, that's perfect. Well, uh, Tom and Steve, again, I just thank you guys so much for sharing your expertise and taking the time to uh, get out here and, and talk um, with students and teachers. Um, I do want to um, let everybody know that we did put a link in the chat or in the comments section, actually, um, for this, where you can sign up for uh, our emails and we'll let you know when we're going to start over uh, in the spring. Um, our plan is to come back in January. Um, we'll probably have one of these in January and then kind of get back on our uh, every other week uh, sort of schedule, but we haven't decided on the date yet. So I don't want to, uh, don't want to put that in here and, and uh, promise a certain date and then we have to change it on you. So please sign up and, and make sure that you get um, awareness. We'll also reach out um, through our other uh, methods that we can to try to let everyone know when we're going to be back online doing these uh, in the spring. But plan is January and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, really enjoyed uh, this fall with you guys and um, certainly hope you guys can join us in the spring. Thanks a whole lot. Have a good uh, holiday season, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Curtis.